for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about a new programming language that I'm working on called Unison. Um, so who am I? I am a, one of the co-founders of a company called Unison Computing. And we are uh, working on the Unison programming language in Boston. I'm also one of the authors of Functional Programming in Scala. Uh, and one of my other co-founders of the, of the company is also my co-author on the, on the book, Paul. Um, <clears throat> all right, so what is Unison? Unison is a programming language. It is superficially similar to Haskell. Uh, it has uh, a permissive MIT license that it's, it's all being developed in the open. It's, a, it's an open source thing. Uh, and it's sort of, you know, modern, statically typed, functional language. Uh, and whereas it looks very similar to Haskell, it has some unique features and, and constraints that, that I want to tell you about. And so big disclaimer at the front, this is very work in progress. Like, there is basically no tooling for this language. Uh, libraries, there, there are basically no libraries for this language. Uh, we, we are actively working on it. But we're very excited about it, and so I want to, I want to tell you uh, what we're doing. So like, this is not for production, uh, at least for like another year or something. OK, so here's the plan. Uh, I'm going to tell you about Unison and why we're making it. Uh, I'm going to show you a small Unison program as an example. Then I'm going to tell you about what is Unison sort of De uh, defining feature, maybe, or, or sort of its most unique thing, which is its novel approach to names. Um, when you turn your head, the mic kind of goes off. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that sucks. Don't get uh, over that. <laughs> OK, I'll just stand very straight. If you just talk a little bit louder, it'll pick it up more. OK, I'll just shout. <laughs> uh, OK, so then I'm going to rant about error messages. Uh, I'm going to hate on monads. And then I'm going to tell you what we're doing sort of in the near term for Unison. Um, OK, so why are we making a new language? Uh, so to tell you more about that, let's go back to the beginning. So we're, we're at the Retro Computer Museum. So um, you know, when I was a kid, I, I loved programming. And, and I had one of these. It's a, a Sinclair Spectrum. Uh, it had 48 kilobytes of memory. Uh, it, it was awesome. Programming these machines was hugely fun. And I, I loved like, seeing my software creations coming to life on this little machine. And it captivated my young imagination. It seemed like anything was possible. And it also seemed like anyone could do this. And I knew at the age of seven when I had this, this computer that I wanted to be a programmer when I grew up. And like, even now, just like looking at this object, just fills me with joy. Uh, so then, you know, I got my first programming job, and I learned that programming professionally was nothing like this. So it was, it was long hours of staring at poorly organized code, thinking, you know, who the heck wrote this? And usually I found out that it was, in fact, I who wrote it. <laughs> and, you know, whereas there were, there were moments of, you know, of sort of this sort of sheer joy of programming, the overall experience was often one of frustration and stress and a sense of sort of overwhelming complexity, a sort of drowning in, in object-oriented stuff. Uh, so then I came to functional programming. And you know, building software from compositional pieces that neatly snapped together was, uh, was great. And programming was fun again. And, and I, again, you know, I get this sense of joy when I'm writing software. At least when I'm writing something small and isolated, something that I can readily understand, something that has a cohesive logic to it and runs on just a single machine. But these days, if you're writing any kind of large-scale application, you need to make lots of programs to all talk to each other. And uh, software systems these days are, are typically not big monoliths. There are lots of different programs that run on different machines, and they all need to communicate and coordinate. So obviously, you know, you could up some JSON serialization logic or some protobufs or something. And like, this doesn't scale at all, you find. And like, soon you have lots of little servers that all interface with like different versions of each other. And you have to hire like an army of programmers 
to write like all the JSON and protobufs or whatever to get them to talk to each other. And it's just like a mess. And then like it's not just protobufs and JSON. It's like lots of different technologies like this. And it's a lot of like duct tape and bailing wire to make modern software systems work. Right, so, so there's this sort of gap that exists between the things that we can specify using programming languages, using you know, functional programming, and then the things we need to actually talk about in order to build a real large scale system. And we're sort of just filling that gap with various special purpose technologies that uh, are sort of ad hoc and don't really have a cohesive logic to them. It's not, you know, uh, beautiful and, and, and uh, uh, co compositional like functional programming is. And like, I don't know about you, but like every time I learned one, one of these, like how to use one of these, I immediately forget. Because it's just like totally arbitrary. And it's not my programming language. You know, like I don't get to talk about these things uh, in my programming language. Uh, because our, our programming languages haven't really caught up with the internet age. Uh, programming languages still only really generate, uh, generally talk about uh, what a single OS process is doing. Uh, but with Unison, we want to revisit that assumption. We want to open up the question of what a program can even be. And so a Unison program actually describes an entire distributed system including deployment and orchestration, scaling up and down, and failover, and it could be like an elastic distributed computation deploying itself to, uh, you know, dynamically to any number of machines. So, <clears throat> whereas today you might write lots of little microservices and, and maybe come up with, you know, protobufs or JSON or whatever to get them all to talk to each other, and then you write a bunch of YAML files to describe the deployment and orchestration, and you write managed versions of your builds and you have various configurations and you have to appoint a build czar and stuff. So instead of that, you write a single program for your whole system and then you deploy the system by running that program. So the sort of grand vision of Unison is that it's like the whole sort of cloud uh, as a single global supercomputer that you program simply and directly as if you were just programming your little microcomputer. <clears throat> so, uh, let me show you an example of some Unison code. So here is a distributed batch mode MapReduce in Unison. So this code on, on the slide does something similar to Hadoop. Uh, so if you're familiar with, with Hadoop, uh, this, this does some, something similar to that. Um, so this function will take some data set, uh, which here is a, a list of values called list. Uh, it takes a, a function, f, to perform on each of the elements, so we map that over the list. And then we have a monoid with which to reduce, so in a sort of distributed fashion. So this would potentially spawn computations on a bunch of nodes and then accumulate in the monoid in a distributed way and then return a single result to the present node. All right, so here's a, a type for it. In, uh, in Unison, and uh, here the argument f has access to this remoting ability. So it could be spawning a new node or pulling a node from a, a, an auto-scaling group or a node pool or something. Uh, the, the important thing is that it's able to execute some strategy for distributing and coordinating this computation in a sort of a first-class way. And, and you can, of course, write your own such strategies. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, what the stuff in curly brackets mean, but um, they, they are abilities or effects so, uh, that we track in the types. So, so this is part of Unison's effect system. Uh, anyway, don't worry if this code isn't immediately comprehensible. The point is that uh, a Unison program that does something interesting like a distributed batch mode MapReduce uh, Inclu that includes deployment and failover and so on, doesn't have to be any more complicated than this. And it looks very similar to the program that you might write to just do this on a single machine. Uh, so the sort of magic that makes this work is that Unison can transfer an arbitrary computation, including its dependencies, to a remote node. 
Uh, so the remoting API has a primitive called at, and we just give that some location. Here I'm giving it the US East production location. And then we give it a quoted program. So note the, uh, the apostrophe there, like I'm quoting this program. So it's, it's not computing a value, it's capturing this as sort of a lazy computation. And Unison will transfer that whole program to the remote location and execute it there. So click count here. So the idea here is that I have some log files. Uh, you know, I have some way of calculating a click count from my log files, and then I can uh, accumulate with some monoid on the click counts. Uh, so click count here could be spawning nodes or pulling them from auto-scaling groups or whatever. Uh, and it'll have access to the full remoting API. So <clears throat> when Unison runs this, it sends a syntax tree over the network. But uh, here's the thing. Will the remote node know what we mean by MapReduce and click count and et cetera? Will it attribute the same meanings to those names as we have on the local machine? The answer is actually that it doesn't matter because Unison doesn't really deal in names. Uh, the human readable names that you see on the screen are just used to communicate with the human programmer. But when Unison commu uh, communicates with other Unison nodes, it sends Unison names, which are deterministic cryptographic hashes of the reference. So, <clears throat> Unison actually identifies a function or type by a hash of its definition. So, it, so any piece of Unison code can be uniquely identified uh, by, by taking its uh, hash of the syntax tree after removing all of the names. So names are, are just metadata uh, that we just sort of attach to, to the hashes. But the hashes are sort of the true uh, immutable eternal names of of the syntax trees. It's sort of like uh, that unison expressions are like stars in the sky and we can discover them independently uh, and like give them different names but, but you know the, the stars are just always kind of there for us to find. <clears throat> so uh, the fact that every expression is deterministically identified by its hash lets us unambiguously communicate code as data across both time and space. So uh, across time, that is, you know, we can, we can it doesn't change over time, the, the hash of, uh, of a given expression. <clears throat> so it's durable, and, uh, and also across space, that is, we can send that across the network, and uh, it doesn't, uh, the, the meaning doesn't change based on the location or what's sort of available at that location. And so uh, when we send a hash to a remote node, the remote node may know what that hash means because it has seen it before, so it'll have it in some kind of cache, or it may respond with, I don't know what that is, please send me the syntax tree. Okay, so, uh, so yeah, there, it's been said that there are two hard problems in computer science. There's cache invalidation, naming things, and off by one errors. Uh, and in unison, naming is a lot more flexible and, uh, and it matters a lot less than in other programming languages. Uh, just lick this bike shit for a minute. <laughs> I really like the color of this bike shit. <clears throat> so, yeah, I've been in a lot of heated bike shedding sessions about what to name something. Uh, and <clears throat> You know, in, in unison, the goal is that we'll never have to do that again. Uh, so if, if you don't like the name of something, you can just change it locally. And, and renaming things is sort of a trivial operation. You just change some metadata on, on your hashes. And it's a, a non-breaking change for, for everyone. And in fact, you'll be able to publish naming schemes as libraries for others to consume if they, if they wish. Uh, just to drive that home here is, uh, an example of two functions that have the exact same implementation, but they have two different names. So one of them is called curry and the other is called Schoenfinkel. Uh, in unison, these are actually not two different functions with the same implementation. They are the exact same function. Uh, if you have both of these definitions in your code base, 
Unison will just create metadata that contains both of those names. And it will sort of save that in uh, a database of, of the code on that node. So a, a Unison code base is a database, and that's an implication of, of uh, what I've just said. Uh, <clears throat> So a Unison code base is not a mutable bag of text files that we, you know, mutate using uh, a text editor. Uh, we still, you know, use a text editor to edit our code, but the code base is a structured immutable object. And uh, <clears throat> that gives us, so, so the, the whole model of the code base is kind of a separate talk. Um, but the, the structured object approach gives us uh, incremental compilation, kind of for free, uh, that is perfectly precise. And you'll almost never spend time waiting for Unison to compile your code, no matter how large your code base is. You know, so it's, it's constantly compiling the, the new things that you add. And, and you'll never have to recompile anything unless you really want to wait. <coughs> uh, Refactoring, uh, the idea is that refactoring should always type check and it's sort of a controlled experience. So you can precisely kind of measure your progress through your refactoring. Uh, arbitrary changes to a code base can, can be completed with, without dealing with like a depressingly long list of type errors. You know, this sort of type error directed programming that we often do in languages like Haskell where you have like 72 errors and then you have to just power through them until your code compiles. Uh, in Unison, we're hoping you'll never, not have to do that. Um, yeah, so uh, code bases can be worked on concurrently by multiple developers. Uh, situations that traditionally uh, result in merge conflicts or build issues can no longer occur. Um, Bruno? Yeah? On those two bullet points, I'm trying to visualize how it's different. Uh, I, I couldn't quite connect the dots there. Oh, so the question is like, how, how does that happen? How is it that merge conflicts don't happen? Yeah, so, so the, the code base is like not a mutable bag of text files on your, on your disk. It's like a database. And then sort of each function will have uh, not the, the text of the function in the database. It will have the syntax tree of the function in the database. And so if you, for instance, I don't know, each you change the definition of something, uh, you actually just add a new hash with a different definition to your, uh, to your database. And so, so you're not merging text files ever. And, and so lots of merge conflicts that, don't, that, that usually happen, they don't come up. Do, do you accidentally have a problem where sometimes you're using old versions of a function where? Oh, well, I'll, I'll get to the, okay. the versioning thing here in a minute. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, renaming is totally trivial. Even like bulk renaming, uh, lots of, of things. It's 100% uh, accurate and it's fast. Uh, and also this sort of dependency hell thing is vastly reduced. Uh, many situations that contribute to dependency hell uh, simply don't arise with this model. Uh, to illustrate that, uh, let me show you the sort of situation of, of a traditional kind of dependency hell uh, situation. So it's kind of this diamond dependency problem where your program depends on two libraries, A and B, and they both depend on some library C. But then they diverge, and now they depend on different versions of library C that aren't compatible, so you end up with a conflict. Right, so uh, uh, much of the time, the problem is just that the libraries aren't really granular enough, that is, uh, in a situation where library A and B depend on totally different parts of library C, uh, that should just work. Uh, and, and in Unison, it, it does, because Unison actually tracks dependencies at the level of individual hashes. The idea of a library is, is different in Unison, and it's more of a first class thing. So actually, what happens in Unison is that your program depends on some hashes, and then those hashes depend on some other hashes, and as long as they don't clash, everything's fine. Um, <clears throat> and like even if they depend on like the same data type in like two versions of a data type in, in a library, 
uh, we'll be able to, to resolve that because you should be able to just use them as two different types because they have two different hashes. However, if you try to pass off the version 3 of c.foo as an instance of version 4 of c.foo, uh, Unison will just give you an ordinary type error. It will just tell you these two types are not the same. Uh, there's a type mismatch, and here it is. Okay, so that brings me to Unison's type system. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, we, so this is our type system. We're implementing this paper, uh, Complete and Easy Bidirectional Type Checking for Higher Rank Polymorphism by Josh Dunfield and Neil Krishna Swami. Uh, it is a really cool type system. I encourage you to check out this paper. Uh, it's bidirectional. So it's not like a unification-based uh, type system, which makes it pretty cool. Uh, and we're also implementing type error provenance that we harvested from a talk by Leonard Augustin. Uh, and that's also really cool. And uh, that actually, uh, that, those things together allow us to give really good error messages to, to programmers. Now, I promise that you'll, you'll usually not have to look at pages and pages of type errors and feel the anxiety of having like 72 errors that you have to fix before your code compiles. But when we do give the programmer type errors, we want those errors to be helpful. Because like, it's kind of funny that we're almost a quarter way into the 21st century and our tools are still giving us errors like it's the 1970s. It's like, it hasn't really advanced from like the, the old computers that are out in the hall, right? Like, you know, for instance, when Haskell gives you a type error, like you almost just like hear this robotic voice and it's like doing this. It's like error cannot match expected type, you know? And, you know, error messages are sort of needlessly technical and terse and, uh, and they don't necessarily help you figure out what the problem is. Uh, so I think that an error a type error should read like another developer explaining the problem to you, I, that, ideally. Um, <clears throat> so here's an example of a language not doing that. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't hate on Haskell. Haskell is my favorite programming language in the world. I, I love it. And it generally gives really good error messages. Like this is, this is good you know, compared to a lot of other languages. Um, but yeah, so you know, I have this case expression here at the bottom, case x of 3 goes to 4 and 4 goes to surprise. And Haskell said, well, I don't have an instance for a num of list of car. Uh, I'm like, what does that mean? I don't know. Uh, so Unison will give an error like this. It'll say, well, all cases of a case of expression must have the same type. Here, one of them is nat and the other one is text. All right, so nat is uh, uh, the, the machine level natural numbers uh, in Unison. So they're, they're 64 bit natural numbers. Uh, so just to jab a Scala a little bit, here's what Scala does. Anybody know what it does? Any, of course. <laughs> so Scala is like way ahead of the game. It's like, this is not even an error. Like, I'm not even gonna. <laughs> so. Uh, okay, so also I think an error should make it obvious how to fix the problem. Right? Because we spend a lot of time looking at type errors, and we spend a lot of time mapping what the error says to the task of fixing it. Um, so here's an example of Unison doing that. So I forgot to put uh, an append operator between hello and name here. And Unison is like, well, this kind of looks like a function call, but there's a text where the function should be. Are you missing an operator? And I'm like, yeah, I, I am. Thanks. Uh, so here's the Haskell but for comparison. It's just like error. And gives you a bunch of, it just bombards you with information. Uh, and then it has like at the bottom, re relevant bindings include, and like they're all totally irrelevant. <laughs> um, anyway, no, Haskell's amazing. I love it. No, really, I, like it's, it's Haskell is beautiful. Uh, okay, so I think that a type error should generally tell you three things. It should tell you where was the mismatch, what were the types involved, and then where did those types come from? All right, well, was there a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I like the nicer errors, but do you pay a cost and overhead for actually determining what 
determining is more, we're giving it more human friendly error messages. Do we pay a cost in what, per performance? Probably. Yeah, yeah, probably. I mean, yeah, our, our errors are, are very structured objects. And so at, 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 uh, at compile time, we're accumulating a lot of information. And so, yeah, it's, it's probably slower. But it's not as slow as trying to figure out what an error message means, I think. Um, but yeah, I, I think that that's, that's not something we're trying to optimize for right now. Anyway, so it should give you um, where is the mismatch? What types are involved? And where did those types come from? Why does Unison think that those types are involved at all? So here's Unison doing that. So here I have uh, a function foo that takes a number of arguments, and they all have to be of the same type A. And uh, I've given it you know, one, two, three, and then this, the text hello. Uh, and Unison is like, <laughs> Well, the fourth argument to that function is text, but I was expecting it to be nat because the function has the following type where uh, a is nat because I found it there. Right? And so well, we try to always do this kind of thing to uh, inform the programmer about why, why does the compiler even think that the, this type is uh, what it thinks it is. Okay, also, if the solution to an error is trivial or obvious, uh, we should just fix it. And just like, not even tell the programmer. Um, because like, in the way that the Unison code base model works is like, once you submit your source to the code base, it, we, we destroy it. It's obliterated. Uh, so if the solution is de totally deterministic, trivial, and obvious, we just fix it, and we throw away the source code, and you, you never know that you made a mistake. And that's totally fine. For instance, if a name is ambiguous, and only one of the solutions to that name type checks, Unison will just pick the one that type checks. So we're doing type-directed name resolution. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of cool. But if, if a name is still ambiguous, uh, uh, so you know, it's able to figure out what it, uh, a bunch of solutions to that, uh, so more than one solution type checks, it'll tell you helpfully which things it knows about that fit the type and the name. So for example here I have uh, said a, like a, poly a polymorphic function that applies plus, but it actually doesn't know what the types of, of A and B are, the things I'm trying to add. And so it's like, are you trying to add natural numbers? Are you trying to add integers? Are you trying to add floats? Like what's the deal here? Uh, and so you need to either disambiguate by giving it a namespace, or you have to give a type annotation. All right, so in a saying, well, whatever this thing is, it conforms to a type like that. Great, so this actually gives us typed holes as well, kind of for free. Um, so here I have misspelled append, and Unison helpfully says, I'm not sure what append means, but whatever it is, it has this type. Um, so it, it, it's something that takes two streams of natural numbers and puts and smashes them together somehow. Uh, okay, great. So another thing we really wanted to be thoughtful about was Unison's effect system. Because, I mean, let's be honest, monads are awkward. I, 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 I came out and said it. Monads are awkward. Uh, they, they come with a syntactic overhead as well as a cognitive overhead. Like, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the time you just, you spend, your, you spend your time trying to figure out like how to lift this thing into the monad you want, or like, you know, in which order is my monad transformer stack supposed to be, and things like that. Um, so uh, Unison uses what's sometimes called algebraic effects. We modeled our effect system in a language called Frank which is detailed in this paper, Dooby Dooby Doo, by Sam Lindley and Connor McBride and Craig McLaughlin. <clears throat> and uh, Frank calls these abilities rather than effects. And so we do that too. We call them abilities. So here's a simple state ability. Um, this is the ability to put and get some global state of type S. Uh, so abilities are introduced with the ability keyword. And this defines two functions, put and get. So put 
takes some state of type S and it returns a unit with the state ability attached to it. And then get will give you that S given that you have the state ability. All right, so what, uh, when we see a thing like this in curly braces, um, it means this requires that ability. All right, so, so put requires the state ability, get also requires the, the state ability. Okay, great, so this is very similar to just like a, an algebraic uh, data type uh, where you just, uh, you know, you're defining this type state S, which is sort of this ability type, uh, and these are the sort of the constructors of the type, put and get. <clears throat> so we can, for example, write effectful functions that push and pop uh, on a sort of global stack. Uh, so given that the state is a stack, that we have the ability to manipulate some state that is a list of A's, we can pop and push. Um, <clears throat> so note that there is no monadic plumbing here. Uh, they're, they're, these are just sort of code blocks. And so to, uh, to pop, we get the stack, we drop one from the stack, and we put that, and then we get the head of the stack. All right, so that's pop. And then push, we just say, well, cons A onto the front of whatever we get, and put that. All right, so there's no applicative syntax or, or, or uh, anything like that, it, because we're actually overloading the function application syntax. So in unison, applicative programming is the default. We, uh, uh, yeah, we sort of cho chose that as, the, as, the, uh, as a design constraint. <clears throat> so the types will ensure that you can't go wrong here, like, that you're not talking about the wrong thing. So for example, whereas in Scala you might say, well, A comes from X, B comes from Y, and then C comes from Z, and then you want to do F of A, B, and C. In unison, you just say f of x, y, z, and it'll just figure that out. It will do the pulling out, and uh, you know it'll do all the, the effects for you. Sorry. Oh, that's there was a question about why is put quoted here. Oh yeah, pop is quoted. The reason is that uh, only computations can have effects, not values. So once you have computed a value, you can no longer have effects. So the quoting is just a, a nullary function that returns whatever the, this evaluates to. All right, so that's a great question. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so in Haskell, you might have to do things like, you know, this applicative syntax. And in unison, that's just the default. You just use the, the function application syntax. And in fact, it works for sort of arbitrarily lifted or mixing of pure things in. Uh, it's still the same, even if you're like, doing lift, lift, and stuff. Uh, and then bind is just function application. So whereas in Haskell you may have to say x bind, you know, lambda of a, f of a, and then bind g. In unison you just say g of f of x. So that's kind of nice. You know, it's, uh, there's a low syntactic overhead to this, and there's a low cognitive overhead to this for the programmer. Um, <coughs> So the programmer can just you know, use our pop and push and write a little program that pushes and pops a stack using our state ability. So given that we have the ability to uh, manipulate some state of type list of nat, we can write this sort of stack program and we can you know, pop an A and then check if that A is five and, and then push five if it is, otherwise do some other stuff. <clears throat> kind of cool. Uh, so then to handle the state ability, that is to make it actually do something, we write a handler using the handle keyword. So this here is a pure handler for the state ability. Uh, and we can uh, use that handler then uh, at the bottom, the run stack thing uses that handler to run the stack program given some initial state, which is 54321. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Normally, this kind of stuff will be hidden away in library code. Like, uh, you know, most, most programmers will not be writing their own handlers. But if, if, you, you know, if you have your own sort of abilities and things, you'll be able to write your own handlers. So this proceeds by pattern matching on the sort of constructors of the effect uh, of the ability. Uh, so here, you know, the definition of state is like handle 
H of S in uh, bank C, where uh, the exclamation point means force this computation. So it's a, C is some quoted computation. You can see that it's quoted in the type. It's something of type state SA. Uh, and then I'm saying like force that, like actually evaluate it, but handle using the handler H, or H of S, where S is the initial state coming in. Uh, you know, it's, it's that 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 thing. And then I, we just proceed by pattern matching on the, on the ability. And we say, well, if, it was, if, the, if the call was to a get, then we end up in that, that case. And what we, what we uh, get out of that pattern is a continuation for the program. And what we do is we either call that continuation or not. And we call it with the result of whatever we do when we get. Uh, so this is a recursive definition here. Uh, so it's actually calling the handler again because k of s might uh, also need access to the state ability. And then to put, we get a state that somebody wanted to put, and we get the continuation of the program. Uh, and we say, well, handle using that new state, and then continue by passing the, the unit to the, to the continuation. Okay, and then in the pure case, when there's no effect, we just return the value that, that we ended up with. Cool. Um, <clears throat> so here's a, another example of, of handling. So here I'm handling an ability into another ability. Uh, so here I have some ability to receive text. And receive has a single constructor, just receive.receive. .receive. And I just get a continuation. And my job is to pass whatever I want the caller to receive to k. So I just say k of read line, where read line is in IO. So a read line requires the IO ability, which I'm not handling here. And so this whole uh, feed function will require the IO ability. So I'm sort of turning this receive text uh, effect into an I.O. effect. <clears throat> so uh, if you try to, for example, uh, use I.O. in pure code, and you don't have the I.O. ability, uh, you get an ability check failure, uh, which, which war warms my Dungeons and Dragons heart. Uh, I don't know if there are any D&D nerds out here, but OK. so. Uh, yeah, so, so this is saying this location requires the I.O. ability, but doesn't have it. All right, so we can't read line in a place that where we, so here I, it, I'm declaring that I have the I.O. ability, or that I require the I.O. ability. But then if I don't do that, I get a type error. Uh, and yes, you can still use monads if you want. Uh, you don't have to use this uh, ability stuff. Uh, you can still just use monads, and it'll, it'll work just fine. Um, <clears throat> OK, so where are we with this? As of right now, uh, we have you know, uh, lots, of, uh, lots of unison written in both uh, Haskell and Scala. Uh, we have Alexa, Parser. Uh, we're, you know, we have the hashing thing down. We got like serialization of code. Uh, and we have the, the bidirectional type checking and the type directed name resolution, uh, type error provenance, and all that stuff. Uh, the languages, algebraic data types, and abilities. Uh, we implemented ability polymorphism, so you have polymorphic abilities. Um, we are giving you structured type errors and type error provenance. Uh, we've implemented a JVM based runtime uh, that has uh, that uses partial evaluation. And uh, it has tail calls, which is awesome. Uh, and we also have a native runtime uh, reference implementation that is really slow and uh, runs out of memory really fast, uh, it, written in Haskell. But, but it, it's sort of a, a demo of like what a, a Unison runtime should look like. OK, so you know, it's, it's coming together. It's, it's looking like a real language now. Uh, and we feel super excited about it. And then the, the near-term roadmap for us is to implement the sort of Unison command line interfaces, like a code base uh, editing tool, and uh, a REPL. Uh, you know, work, work on the distributed runtime. And 
write some, some actual libraries, uh, you know, documentation, and, and of course a sweet looking website with like, you know, things, JavaScripty stuff flying across uh, with tutorials and examples. All right, uh, so we're hoping to have a, a Unison release uh, sometime in the spring of 2019 if we hold to our, our schedule. Uh, so in the meantime, if you want to know more and follow our progress, go to unisonweb.org. Uh, and if you want to contribute to the development of Unison, please talk to me after uh, the talk during, during the conference. Uh, thank you.